Welcome everyone, we're back. Is a GIC a good idea? Two years ago, people didn't really ask that question. Now it's a much different scenario. We're gonna tackle that today. Kevin, let's just dive right into it. We gotta cover one or two basics and then we'll get into the pros and cons of the GIC. Let's start with some of those basics. Yeah, why are we talking about GICs today? Well, basically because they're tied to interest rates. And what have we had over the last year? We've had interest rates do nothing but rise. We've seen an unprecedented historic rise in interest rates. And they are higher than they were, you know, six months ago, higher than they were a year ago. So that's been the biggest scenario is that GICs are basically tied to interest rates. It's the same as mortgages. As rates go up, mortgage rates go up. Thanks to the exact same thing as do credit unions, you start to see the interest rates go up on your GICs. And that's the real reason why they're being talked about more today. I mean, a year, year and a half ago, maybe you're getting 2%, but now, you know, 2% vastly higher than that. We're double yeah. that on almost every GIC that's out there, isn't it? That's the idea. That's the only reason we're really talking about them now is because they've finally gone up on the first time in about 10, 12 mm -hmm. years. Why would someone want to own a GIC? What can make it a good idea? Well, the first reason we'll go through a couple here. The first one is very much stability. You know what you're going to get, right? Yep. You, you lock in your GIC, maybe do a three year or five year, whatever suits your needs. And then you can forget about it. It doesn't matter what's in the news. It doesn't matter if the market is up, down, left, right the next day. You got your return locked in. So you get that level of stability. And I'd say that's one of the key reasons why folks look to a GIC is they get a little certainty, they get a little stability, but it goes beyond that, Kevin. It's not just that there's stability. It's the fact that you can actually, you know, rubber stamp and say, hey, that's guaranteed. Yeah, you're right. I mean, the guarantee is the big thing, right? All of a sudden, you know, if I've got a GIC that's paying me 5% for five years, I know that each and every year I'm getting that 5%. Mm -hmm. There is no, oh, it's moving up and down. The market's done this. Interest rates have moved up or down. You know, I got to worry about where my bond price is or GICs, as you mentioned, first stability because they're constant. Second is the guarantee. That 5% will be constant every year for those five years. So I don't have to worry at all about having a, an interest rate move on me and being affected. I don't have to worry about the prices of the GIC moving and be affected. And that can be huge for some people just knowing they've got that guaranteed rate each and every year. Yeah. And it's also what's behind the guarantee, right? So I go to the, the local yes. bank and they guarantee the return, but then the bank is backed up by some insurance. Now we won't get into all the nitty gritty here. There's different insurance programs depending on mm -hmm. where you get your GIC, but high level, you have the CDIC, Canadian Deposit Insurance Corporation, that's kind of federally run for your federal institutions, yep. $100,000 of coverage there per institution or per account, I should say. And then you have the credit unions. They're a little different. They're provincially. So each province is slightly different, but ultimately backed up by the credit union central of that particular province. So there is some insurance backing up the institution, making the guarantee. So a couple levels of protection there, uh, which means the guarantee is usually pretty strong in Canada and you can rely upon it. And that, that's a key difference, right? That's one of the, the big reasons people look to GICs is for that strong guarantee. Uh, another one here, Kevin, I'll throw this uh, to you. And we, we mentioned it earlier, people are doing this because you can finally get paid. It's no longer 1%. That's right. I mean, they never looked at it. And as we mentioned, nobody came to us beforehand over the last mm -hmm. number of years to say, hey, can I go into a GIC? Because you just weren't getting the return. Inflation's mm -hmm. at 2%. Maybe you're getting 2%. Maybe you're getting less than 2%. Whatever the case may be, it's taking a while. Nowadays, 4 or 5%. Even with inflation, you're getting a nominal return, something that you can actually put your hands on and say, look, I'm making yeah. money now. That is a huge factor for people because beforehand, you know, why would I go into a GIC at 2% if I can get, you know, a stock that's paying me foreign dividend? It's going to be mm -hmm. a higher return that I can get. But now when they're seeing that, that is huge to be able to get that nominal return. Because again, you can put that towards everything that you deal with going forward for whatever your money's invested for. Yeah. And if you have questions on this or really any financial topic, we'd love to hear mm -hmm. from you. So if you're questions about GICs, if they're a fit for you, please go to the website, Kevin's point to chat with clintonkevin.com. That's a mouthful. Chat with clintonkevin.com. <laughs> Fill in the form comes right to us. We'd certainly love to hear from you. Uh, continuing on here, we looked at a couple of reasons why GIC could be a good idea. Of course, there's going to be another sign to that mm -hmm. coin, why it might not be a good idea. The first one here, Kevin, is you really are tying up the money. It's locked in. So if you do a five-year GIC, you really can't touch it for five years. Yeah, no, I mean, the big difference between a GIC and a lot of everything else out there is that liquidity issue. And that can mm -hmm. be huge for some people. I mean, if you're looking for monthly income coming out of a GIC or, or coming out of your retirement account, should I say, a GIC for five years may not be appropriate for you because you're not getting paid on it. It could be annual that you get paid or it could be you compound it for the entire five years. 
Having the stability and everything is one thing, but if you want to get access to that money, GICs do not allow that for you. So, I mean, if you put it in, as Clint said, for five years, you're not getting that capital out of there for five years. There's no way to cash it, whereas maybe that's not the appropriate thing for you. So you do have to consider that locked-in period compared to the liquidity issues that you have going forward, and that's very important for picking whether or not this is the top or the, uh, the investment for you. Yeah, and you can do, I should mention, cashable GICs, but like yeah. anything, the more bells and whistles you get on it, the more expensive it costs. So in this case, if you get that cashable feature, meaning you're not actually locked in for the full term, you can get the money earlier, well, you get a lower rate of return. Mm -hmm. uh, so always things to consider, but the lack of liquidity, the, the inability to get the money right away uh, is certainly one item you'd have to keep, uh, keep in mind. Another here, Kevin, and no one likes paying taxes, so this is definitely a big not item. But GICs are not tax efficient. In fact, they're the exact opposite. They're kind of bottom of the rung there in terms of tax efficiency because it's all interest income, so it's all fully taxed. Now, if you have it in a TFSA or in an RSP, different situation. But if you just have a regular investment account, non-registered account, it, you have to claim all of it in income and pay the full tax hit. Now, perhaps you can walk us through this a little bit here, Kevin. There's a kind of a hierarchy when it comes to taxes. Yeah, I mean, basically, if you're dealing with, as you mentioned, the the registered accounts, then this really doesn't apply to you. But it's the non-registered accounts where people have money that you have to worry about. And basically, the, the tradition is capital gains give you the best sort of a tax break. You're only showing 50 percent. Mm -hmm. Dividends sort of give you a, a summed up amount that you can take off. And then interest income is just like pure income. If you earn 500 bucks on it, that 500 goes to your income and you're showing the entire amount that you have to pay tax on. So they are the least efficient tax wise. And the reason they are is because they're giving you that guarantee. The government says you put a little more risk in your investments, we'll give you a tax break. But mm -hmm. if you're willing to just take things that are guaranteed, stable, going to give you a set rate, then we're going to tax you fully on that when you earn anything that's coming off of it. So least tax efficient. And that's something that you do have to consider when you're putting it in a non-registered account. Trade-offs, always about trade-offs. There's no magic mm -hmm. solution, unfortunately. There's always a trade-off. In this case, you get stability guarantee. You're giving up some liquidity and you're giving up the tax efficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, the other side of that coin, and this is relevant for right now, it's inflation, right? Uh, right. Often GICs go up because we're in periods of high inflation. Inflation goes up, the central banks say, hey, we don't want high inflation. So they raise interest rates to fight that inflation. <laughs> And when they raise rates, GIC rates follow along with them. But if you think about what the situation we're in now, you had, you know, eight, nine percent inflation not that long ago. Even now we're still in the four or five zone and GIC rates are only at the four or five percent level. Or if you go back to the, the, the heyday, I'm using heyday loosely here, but often folks will refer to the 80s where, hey, I used to get a guarantee of 10 percent in the bank. Well, inflation was 12 at that time. That's why rates were so high and mortgages, you know, were, were even higher than that. Uh, so it's rare. It happens sometimes, but it's quite rare. You'd actually beat inflation with a GIC. Usually you just keep up or you're actually a little behind inflation. So that's another one of the trade-offs is if inflation is a concern for you, GICs probably aren't going to beat inflation. They'll likely keep up at best, if not be a little behind inflation. So lots to consider here, Kevin. Not a magic solution. You have to look at the trade-offs. It really comes down to really your plan, right? What's the best fit? for you. Yeah, I mean, it's basically the Becker or mantra is you need a financial plan to figure out whether this is appropriate <laughs> for you. They have to be a fit. And that's the biggest question on everything. I mean, everybody always likes to have, you know, I'd like to go out there and find something where I can put my money in and guarantee 8% with no loss mm. and have the liquidity issues to be able to deal with it. But that's just not reality. We can't give you anything along those lines. So you have to make the trade offs and see whether that's the fit. Getting that 5% guarantee may be nice, but can I do it without the liquidity? Can I do it with the interest that may be coming in? You have to make sure that this fits with your financial plan going forward and that this is something that you need to put in your portfolio that way. Otherwise, there are other investments that we can take a look at from there. So make sure you have that fit. And as Clint mentioned, the inflation factor can have a huge effect on that as well. And that's probably why we're talking about a lot of this today. Yeah, the high inflation. In fact, we have a whole video on how to hedge inflation. It's going to be right there if I did my pointing correctly. <laughs> over Kevin. So if you like this one, you're going to love that one. Click on the video. We'll see you again very soon.